Niti kini san Amo Banashi, misk ni dodem. My Cree name is Amo Banashi, it means hummingbird. I'm from the beaver clan of the Opaskwiat Cree Nation, and I'm super excited to be here today. First time at the Fantasyland Hotel. <laughs> Feels a little bit like Disney World in there, although I've never been to Disney World, so I don't really know. <laughs> Um, thanks to the organizers for bringing us out. We really appreciate the opportunity to spend some time. I'm going to spend some time talking for a little bit about the book. Uh, then Andrew will uh, come on stage and talk to you about the writing of the book, and then I'll, I'll come back. Uh, we have another session um, at uh, 1.30, and so any of you uh, who are there really looking forward, to it, please try and think of some questions uh, for the Q&A session that will take place right after this. So... Um, I uh, grew up in uh, all across the prairies. My father was in the Air Force, so I'm one of those very rare Indians who's a status Indian, but was born in uh, West Germany when that was an actual country. We moved back here when I was very little, and I lived in, here in Edmonton, where I actually went to kindergarten. And although I should not say this because uh, of you know internet security, I am very proud to say that my very first teacher, my kindergarten teacher, was named Miss Flippowitch. Um, and she hugged us every day, I remember that, it was nice. I lived after that uh, in Portage of Prairie, and in Gimli, and then in uh, central North British Columbia. And all throughout that childhood experience, um, there was, in the background, this trope of Ukrainianism. Right? Like, I knew lots of Ukrainian kids, and every summer, we would drive from uh, Quenelle, which is just south of Prince George in British Columbia, to Winnipeg, and we'd pass through Vagerville. And it'd all be that giant egg. It was amazing. And somehow, I never thought to ask, why? Why is it that Canada is home to so many Ukrainian immigrants? Why is there this giant Easter egg in Vagerville? It just never occurred to me. And I think that that's a lot about our country that exists sort of in the background and that we come to accept as normal and natural and we don't ask a lot of questions. Valley of the Bird Tail is a history of Canada. Uh, and it's a particular telling of the history of Canada. It's an honest account. Uh, and the way we want to tell the story of Canada is by following two families uh, who live side by side across a river from one another, each in their own little community. Weiwei Sikapo, the Indian Reserve, founded right about the same time as the community of Rossburn, which is mostly populated with Ukrainian immigrants. And these two communities, though they are across the river from one another, and this is a very common situation, as you know, all throughout the country, little town, reserve right next door. So Rossburn and Weiwei are really common, they're typical. And it's also not uncommon what's happened there in the past 150 years, which is that these two communities, although they grew up side by side, they literally do not know each other. They do not talk to each other. They have no interaction with one another. And actually, we wanted to write about these two towns because they actually offer us this sort of interesting kind of experiment where two communities founded at the same time, and one of them we're going to support. We're going to put in economic infrastructure to get their grain to market. We're going to provide very cheap land. We're going to provide generally good schooling. And right across the river, we take another community, and that community, we're going to outlaw their cultural expressions. We're going to make it illegal for them to use any kind of modern farm equipment. We're going to actually make it illegal for them to sell anything off reserve, any kind of uh, agricultural products. And then fast forward through the generations to see what happens. And what happens is what happens in Rossburn and Weiwei and has happened all across the country, which is that through policy choices that we've made that Andrew will talk more about, we've managed to create a situation of poverty in First Nations communities. And we all know about the poverty, right? We all see it. It's everywhere. But it's one of those background things. Like, why are all these Ukrainians here? And I'll tell you why. I'll talk a little more about it. Um, but 
one of the things that I learned in writing uh, Valley of the Bird Tale with Stobo was the history of Ukrainian immigration to Canada, that it's no mistake that there are so many Ukrainians here. At the turn of the last century, uh, we had a policy of bringing Ukrainians. Uh, they were facing oppression at the time, the same way they're facing oppression today. And through a concentrated effort to, uh, and I'll talk more about this later, but to populate the prairies, uh, Canadians go to Europe and we bring all these Ukrainians. Ukrainians are here because we opened our arms in the very best way that we want Canadians to open their arms, in the way that we're still opening our arms to Ukrainian immigrants. So that was something new for me to learn, and I'll talk more about what I learned uh, when I come back onto the stage. But for now, I want you just to uh, rest with the knowledge that Valley of the Bird Tale is about our shared history. It's not a history of indigenous Canada. It's about this nation that we all share. And it's about the way that we've made choices in the past through governments, both liberal and conservative, for 150 years that have created conditions of inequality. And somehow, we've managed to look past that. What we wanted to do with Valley of the Bird Tale, and I think we managed to do to some degree, is to bring out the stories of people for whom this has had an effect. Real people, everyone in Valley of the Bird Tale, to their credit, they're all real people. And they all agreed to use their real names. And some of them are shown not at their best. But they're real people, some of whom change, some of whom grow. And they're very much like the rest of us, all of us capable of change, capable of growth. Uh, I'm going to uh, stop talking now and bring Stobo up to tell you more about the book, and I'll come back in half an hour and talk a little bit more then. So thank you, everyone. I'll be back in half an hour. Andrew Stobo Snyderman. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, Brant and Diane for, from CAS for the invitation and Rick from ARPDC. Thrilled to be here. I'm quite certain this, this is the first and last time that I will ever have a hot tub with a bunch of mirrors in my room. <laughs> Maybe you all go to places like that, but I'm trying to enjoy it while I can. So I grew up in Montreal, not West Germany, which doesn't even exist anymore. And I, but I've spent the last six years thinking about education on the prairies. <clears throat> and the truth is that we're just a couple guys who wrote a book. And the real work is being done by the people in this room, in the schools, with the children who hopefully end up knowing a lot more than we do. But I'm really thrilled that some way or another, you are all going to get a copy of this book. It's looking like they're going to arrive tonight. And we're actually quite hopeful that you're going to find something in this book that's of real value to you and maybe to your students. We wrote it for you. We wrote it, wrote it for you, educators and your students. And we wrote it because of what's happening in this province and around the country, which is indigenous students are not graduating very often. And I think in Alberta, just like in the rest of Canada, it's about 50%, depending how you calculate that. And that's totally, totally unacceptable. And Rick just mentioned someone in our book named Maureen Tuvoice. And she was an indigenous young woman taking the bus from her reserve to go to high school. And every year, from grade nine all the way to the end, fewer and fewer students from the reserve we're on that bus. And she's one of the few that actually graduates. And what's amazing about Maureen is not just that she encountered all these obstacles and overcame them, but it's that she doesn't feel that special. She just feels like she's lucky. And she knows that there's all these talented kids who she grew up with who didn't make it for all kinds of reasons. And so we wrote this book to try to understand how did we get to this place? 
And to help us hopefully understand that a bit better, I'm going to talk about two things just now. One of them is what we deal with in the book, which is kind of the broader context outside of our schools that help explain why are we so unequal. And the second is that I want to talk about the last 60 years of education, more or less, of indigenous students in Alberta and just like the rest of the country to give a context maybe for what you're seeing in your schools today. And then you're going to hear from Douglas one more time at the end. And I have to say that I'm someone who grew up in Montreal, and I had no contact with these issues whatsoever. And I spent my whole life hearing about how awful, well, once I was a sentient, reading, thinking person, about how awful residential schools were. And people were apologizing about it left, right, and center. And it was about 10 years ago that I found out how horribly we were treating schools and students on reserves. And I thought, how could this be? How could we be doing another wrong to all these children for my entire lifetime? And so this book was my way of learning about this stuff. So let's talk about this bigger context of inequality. Because here in the present, we have two big problems. One of them is the fact of this inequality, the overrepresentation of indigenous people in jails, these low graduation rates, the lower length of life, the situation in child welfare. That's a big problem. But I think an even bigger problem is how, how many of us have kind of come to accept that as normal. And somehow people don't really see that. And it's almost like, and I'm sure you've all heard this from maybe your colleagues or people you've met, that it's almost like, you know, if they're not doing well, it's kind of their fault. They're not trying hard enough. It's certainly not as hard as we're trying, so it must be something wrong with them. And I think one way to think about this book is we're trying to attack that way of seeing the world. They're at least complicated a little bit. And we do that, by, as Douglas was saying, by contrasting what happened on these two sides of a river in a valley between a town and a reserve. And let me give you a couple examples of what we talk about. There was this thing called the pass system. I wonder how many people have heard of that. At least some. The, those brave enough to lift their hands. And this system lasted for about 60, 65 years, definitely in Alberta, I think was the last record of it being enforced. And it meant that you couldn't leave your reserve if you didn't get permission by the Indian agent. And sometimes you actually needed a letter of recommendation to leave your reserve. And that, of course, meant you couldn't go to jobs, you couldn't go leave the reserve for education. And one of the most awful examples is parents weren't allowed to go visit their children at school, out of the communities. So the government took students to these residential schools and they prevented parents from going to visit them. And if you had a copy of this book, and I hope you will soon, I would point you to a picture in this book. And it's of a pass that a man named John Constant was given. And the pass says, yes, John Constant, we're giving you permission this one time to go visit your kids at residential school. And it's really quite horrifying when you think about it because we have to think of all the people who didn't get permission. And that's exactly, of course, what the government wanted. But on the other side of the river, you could go wherever you wanted, just like today. And by the way, that was always illegal. The government always knew that system was illegal, and they kept enforcing it anyway. And they said, you know what? We're just going to try to keep it from indigenous people as long as possible that there's actually no legal justification for it. I'll give you another example. There was this thing called the permit system, which I think Rick just mentioned, which meant that, or Douglas mentioned, that you could not sell anything that you grew on a reserve or an, an animal that you raised unless you got permission from a federal Indian agent, again. And you won't be surprised to know that that devastated economies on reserves, and this system lasted into the 1970s. And there's another striking photo in this book, I think, of a permit 
that was given to a guy named Hugh McKay, Jim's father. And it said, you are allowed, Hugh McKay, to sell your load of barley for 45 bucks. And this was in 1947. And what makes the story even more awful is that this man, Hugh McKay, had just spent five years fighting Nazis in Europe and had been wounded and almost died. And he comes back to Canada and they say, you cannot sell your barley without our permission. Imagine how humiliating that was. On the other side of the river in the town, not only can you sell anything you want to anyone you want, but the government built them a railroad stop. So it was really easy to get your stuff to market. On one side of the river on the reserve, as many of you I'm sure know, there were criminal laws passed that said it is illegal to practice your ceremonies. They called it dancing. Of course, it wasn't just dancing. It was a, a form of worship, often. And on the other side of the river, these Ukrainians recently arrived to Canada are celebrated in this country. And they said, the government would say, we're glad to have you here. We're going to make you part of this great Canadian mosaic. Don't be a Canadian, be a Ukrainian Canadian. Dance your dances, have your ceremonies. On one side of the river, on the reserve, as we all know, children were stolen from their families at five years old for, since the 1880s. And I'm not going to focus on this really at all today, but we heard from Rick an example where a boy ran three marathons a day in a row to go see his family. And what happened the next day was that an Indian agent captured him and he was sent right back. On the other side of the river, you've got public schools, which weren't always great 100 years ago, but they kept getting better and better. On one side of the river, you were not allowed to get a homestead. And on the other side of the river, for $10, you got 160 acres, which of course you could use to get loans, because it would be your collateral, so people could start businesses. And just in case any of this sounds like ancient history, for the last 40 years, as many of the people in this room know, you got a lot, lot less money for your schools on reserve. And you know as well what this meant in practice. It meant it was really hard to retain your good teachers. You often run out of supplies. You can't afford the extra resources that make a difference with students who are struggling. And on the other side of the river, you have the public education system, where if any government threatens to cut your funding, everyone, 90% of families, with children are affected by that and they get pretty pissed off when people try to cut the funding. And that's why we got into a universe where you could have this town that was getting about $10,000 per student as of about 10 years ago. And on the reserve school, you got about 6,000. And what was even more gross about that is that for high school, when the reserve sent their children to public schools, they would have to pay the higher rate, the 10,000 bucks. And so you had even less money for your own children on reserve. And I think all of these examples I've given, and then we try to give in this book, help to explain why are so many students dropping out? Why are there so many children in care? Why do so many people end up incarcerated? Why are so many people suffering? This book could have just been a story about oppression of indigenous people, but I think we know that it's, the story as much of Canada is a lot more complicated than that. And interesting. And there's a big story about immigration to this country, like of the Ukrainians. And they suffered in some ways too. They faced real racism. They had real obstacles. And they did overcome a lot of stuff. And perhaps one of the problems we have is that very few of us are able to hear those two stories in our mind so that we can acknowledge that, yeah, there's actually some commonalities. But if you pay enough attention, 
Fundamentally, the government was on the side of the immigrants, and the government was not on the side of indigenous people in this country. And over the decades and the generations, these policies make a huge, huge difference. But somehow, it's too easy for us today, if you're a non-indigenous person, to kind of look at this situation and say, you know what, it's because we were industrious and we saved our money and we were virtuous and we could do it, make our way out of poverty, why can't they? Which I'm sure you all hear on a very regular basis. And it's so much more complicated. And I think it's because we don't hear each other tell our stories. So that's what I have to say about the big context. I also want to mention some more context about education over the last 60 years. There were really four stages, as I think of it, of education for indigenous children. There was the residential school period, which lasted quite a long time. There was a period of integration in the 60s and 70s. And then after that came this era of separate schools on reserves. Those schools run by bands only were created mostly in the late 70s and early 80s. And now, as you all know, we're kind of in this middle place. So I'm going to say a little bit about these periods. I'm actually not going to say that much about residential schools. I think we've talked enough about that. But we should remind ourselves, I think, that the survivors of these schools are still among us, the people who attended these schools, but their kids and their grandkids are survivors too. But let me tell a little bit about this ed period of education. I think it's a little bit less known, this period of integrated education. And the idea was that the federal government, who was running all these residential schools, decided, you know what? I think we should get all these kids into the same schools. We should bring them together. We'll bring them in to the provincial system. These residential schools are quite expensive. We could spend a lot less if all these kids were together. And it was also trendy at the time to think, you know what, if we just do everything together, then there'll be way less racism because the kids have to be together from the get-go. And on the face of it, that actually sounds pretty good. But that's not how it worked out at all. And all these students from reserve who were thrown into these provincial schools found a totally inhospitable environment for them where they were not recognized for who they were. And it was a different method as residential schools, but the, the goal was still assimilating. It made no account whatsoever for indigenous students being different in any way. And there was an, an extraordinary backlash from indigenous communities. And there were two major articulations of what was going wrong. One of them was in a document produced in Manitoba called Wabung. Has anyone heard of that document? It was a long time ago, a couple at that table. It's an amazing document. And it talks about how integrated education, as it then was, was an invitation to participate in the annihilation of our culture and our way of life. And many non-Indians believe that we have failed education. But the truth of the matter is that education has failed us. The next year, there was a document that came out called Indian Control of Indian Education. I'm quite certain that more of you have heard about that. And it kept explaining what was wrong with the public school system. And they said, in the current system, our children, our students, are experiencing inferiority, alienation, rejection, and hostility. And until now, Decisions on the education of Indian children have been made by anyone and everyone except Indian parents. And the resistance to school and public schools was so fierce that the federal government, and it was then Jean Chrétien who was in charge of it, he said, you know what, you're right. Actually, public schools are a total whitewash, as it is. And at that time, across the country, in 1972, the graduation rate for indigenous children was 4%. And the thing is, 
I think then as now, indigenous parents know that their kids are not dumb. There's nothing wrong with them. There's something wrong in the way that they're treated in schools. And so the idea was, let's give more control to communities over their own schools. And so communities pulled their kids out. They literally walked out of public schools, you know, one summer in that period between the late 70s and the early 80s. And in this community we're writing about, it was in 1982. And they were so desperate to have a school that they set up in a hockey rink. And they used plywood and kind of did this impromptu thing that was a total fire hazard. But that's how desperate they were. And they love hockey there, so like giving up their hockey arena was a big deal. And one thing that I, disturbs me about this is that in this period with all these separate schools in Canada, as we have now, where over 110,000 Indigenous students in this country, and I know many thousands in Alberta, the thing is that they knew, and maybe many of the people in this room knew this, which is we're getting way less than provincial schools. 40% less, 50% less. But we're still going to do things separately because we don't trust the public school system. We don't think our kids are going to be treated with dignity. And I have trouble imagining how hard of a choice that is, to deny all your children fair resources because your experience with the public schools was so bad. And today, we're in kind of this in-between place where you have a lot of indigenous students in the public schools coming for high school or from the get-go. We have a lot of students in separate schools. And a lot of students live off reserve. I think more students than live on, on reserve in Alberta, and they're attending public schools. But these, this background, this history, I think, also helps explain why are the outcomes the way they are. Every family of, that's in your schools, every child, their parents, their grandparents, went through this whole story, and none of it really was positive. So now, the challenge we face in the provincial public system, where I know not everyone in this room is involved, is to try to figure out how do we make these children, indigenous children, feel more welcome? How can we help them succeed? How can we do better than what happened in the 60s and 70s? And another way to say that is, you know, how can we make integration work? And how can we make the difference of indigenous children not be a burden for them? And how can we make it a resource for everyone else? And just a basic example of this would be, it's one thing to offer language classes like Cree and Ojibwe, but another one would be to allow all the students to take that class. And can we imagine a world in which a bunch of Ukrainian Canadians are learning those languages? I think that's where we want to get. And of course, this is part of the work of reconciliation we're all trying to do. I want to say a final word about this book, which we're hyping up without showing it to you, I'm sad to say. <laughs> we met with, Douglas and I in January met with a bunch of superintendents in Manitoba, and we asked them, you know, how do you reach your students on these issues? How can you communicate with them? How can you get them thinking? And they said, stories. We need to tell the students really good stories. And Douglas and I spent five years on this book because we made every effort to make it a book of stories that was actually easy to read in the sense that it's not like a textbook. It's not always easy because it can be very distressing at times. And we tried to also write a book that resonates with indigenous and non-indigenous readers in equal measure. And that's partly because we have characters, you know, each family from these two groups. And you may be excited to know that all these characters are students or they're teachers. So this focus of this book is really education. And we wrote it in such a way, I hope, as to actually build bridges and create dialogue from people coming from totally different places. And I hope, I sincerely hope, that 
It's a use of use to you and your students, and you will be able to judge that for yourselves. And I just want to say one last thing about why I love hanging out with teachers, and that's that I think often of the words of Frederick Douglass, this amazing abolitionist in the United States. He said this after slavery ended, and he was trying to figure out, you know, how can we help white and black people kind of move beyond this? And he said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken adults. And I think the people in this room, I suspect in large part, you're committed to kids because we know that they can do better than us. And many, many thousands of children's approach to reconciliation, it's in your hands. And it's hard work, and I really honor that work. And I think that's all I've got to say for now. Oh, I'll say one more thing, actually. Can I say one more thing? Is that cool, Douglas? Yeah. So I, I want to speak for a moment as a non-Indigenous person. And I don't know about the people in this room, but I sometimes get the feeling, even with myself and certainly with my friends and colleagues, that as a non-Indigenous person, there's kind of this squeamishness about being involved in any way in reconciliation. And there's this instinct to cede all the place and, all, and put all the work on Indigenous people. And speaking for myself, I think that's a big, big mistake. Because it really sucks to be the person in the room having to correct everyone as an indigenous person. It really sucks to have to do all the work. And we cannot fix this stuff if we don't work together. And I'm not saying that all the white people have to be the first person to talk and have to be in charge of anything. That's definitely not the way to go. But all of us need to be on board somehow. And all of our kids need to be involved somehow. It's the only way we're really going to move forward. And working with Douglas has been one of the best experiences of my life because it's been us cooperating and trying to do together what we can't do alone. So with that, I will leave you. Thank you. Hey, everyone again. Thank you, Stobo. So, when I was an undergrad, I took a philosophy class. And I remember that one of the topics was about the philosophy, like, what, what is history? And whether history could be conceived as and constructed and understood as a social science. And that essay sort of always stuck with me, and I never, to this day, still don't really understand what it meant. But this is a book of history. And I want us to think for a moment about, like, what is history? It's not, like, what, just what happened in the past. History is about our telling of what happened in the past. It's about narratives. And I think that some time ago, not very long ago really, um, I realized that people understand history the way they understand property. Now, I teach property in a law school. I teach in the first year program. It's actually where Andrew and I met. He was my student. And people enter into my property law class kind of confused about how we're going to spend 10 months together, eight months together. And they all ask, are we going to do real estate transactions? I'm like, no, no. But people think they understand what property is and how it works and how it relates to each of us and to each other because they have property. But it turns out, actually, students don't understand anything about the legal structure of property, because actually the legal structure is different than just carrying stuff around. And I think our sense of how we understand history, that narrative arc, the story about what happened, that gets put in us when we're really little, maybe into high school. And then we don't really fill that box up much after that. Like maybe some of you are avid history readers, maybe some of you did it in your undergraduate 
But for the most part, history just drops off our reading list somewhere around the middle of high school. Now, my son, Otis, is in grade 10. He's a fantastic student. Uh, he completed uh, one semester. We got his report card. Um, he'd had a history class. And his report card said in the comments, Otis has completed his study of Canadian history. And I think that a lot of us wander around with this sentiment in our head that we know what happened, that we finished our study of history. And it turns out most of what we've been taught uh, is untrue, or a very thin version of the truth. The narrative that we want to tell, and that we do tell in Valerie the Bird Tale, is a really personal history. It's told through the lives of real people. And writing it was hard for me at times because I see my relatives in many of the characters. I see myself sometimes. And, you know, it's remarkable that Maureen is the first of her, first of her family to not go to residential schools, but so am I, right? Like, my mother was taken, and actually my mother, Prior to her being taken to residential school, she lived on a trap line. And a generation later, I'm a professor of law. So change can happen. The story of Linda, who's the mother, and Maureen's mother, is hard to tell and it's hard to read. We do follow her a little bit through residential school, um, and that part was hard. It's hard because I see in Linda, I see my aunties, and I see in Maureen, I see my cousins. And I think in a lot of the characters in, um, in the town of Rossburn, they're very familiar to me. They're like people I knew growing up. It's the historical narrative that stuck in us that can be hard to challenge because we often don't really see that it, we don't really realize that we've fallen into this trap of thinking that we know stuff. So, for example, one of the characters that we write about is this really awful man, and, and he's, he's actually named Hater Reed. He's a very, very bad Indian agent. He's a bad man. But when we're writing uh, this book, the research that we have to work with uh, is varied. It comes from archival sources. It comes from personal interviews. It comes from journals. The material on Hater Reed is thin. It's mostly all his stuff, like his journal entries. And he writes about his heroic life on the prairies about sled dogging across the prairies in the moonlight and about being the sole European to bring civilization to the prairies. And we wrote that part of the book and it just bothered me. And I, I just could not figure out why. And we talked about it for a while and I, I came to realize that the thing was that we, we had fallen ourselves into that valorization of Hater Reed, in part because that's the only version of the story that we had, because it's from his journals. But also, and this is the sad truth, it's because it resonated with us, right? It repeated that story we learned in grade three or grade four about settling the prairies. It resonated with us so that we looked past it. We were able to modulate that a little bit and bring it back to Earth, but narrative is such an important part of the way we think about the world. I, I've been teaching a course um, at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law for about eight years now. It's called Indigenous Legal Traditions and the Imperial Response. It's a great name. And one of the things that we have to do in that class is we have to like figure out how to challenge even our own personal understandings of the world. And I'll just give you one example. And that's the trope of the drunken Indian, historically. I mean, we're all familiar with the story, right? Traders came, they got Indians drunk, we signed the treaties, we stole their land, we rolled them. Never happened. Hard to believe, but the structure of treaty making prior to Confederation 
was about oral agreements. They took many, many days. They were public events. There's just no opportunity for that story about rolling drunken Indians to the treaty lands to ever happen. And yet, even I, for a couple of years teaching the course, even though I kept looking in the historic record, even though I knew that it had never happened, it took me a couple of years to say it out loud. And my students were like, what? I mean, it's not that we have any proof. No one showed us the evidence when we were kids, right? We just believed it. The narrative got into our heads. And that was a story that we told ourselves. Now, I mean, it's also true that, you know, during the fur trade, occasionally uh, some traders would get some Indians drunk and, you know, maybe they'd go to the fur trade post and sell all the furs. But, like, how many times can that happen, right? You've got to go home at some point and explain where all the furs went. <laughs> so it doesn't happen very often. And if we look at a lot of the early trade agreements, right, they, they, they want the French or the British to bring a barrel of rum once a year because it's fun. <laughs> That's why. But that story about rolling Indians taking their land, that's just not a thing that ever happened. But it's a thing that we want to believe because it makes the truth easy. And the truth isn't easy. History isn't easy. It's complicated. And it's hard. But I think it's time that we start being honest, at least, about what really happened. Another character that I want to talk a little bit about is, um, is Clifford Sifton, who to many people, uh, I mean, and I'll be honest, I did not really know anything about Clifford Sifton, uh, but he's been a hero to many, many people, and it turns out um, he's a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde. So Clifford Sifton was the Minister of the Interior at the turn of the last century, and that meant he had two jobs. The first was signing treaties. The reason he wanted to sign treaties, the reason he'd been assigned to sign the treaties or have them signed, was because he wanted to clear the prairies. Signing the treaties meant moving on to reserves, breaking up nations into little tiny communities, postage stamped around the province. You know, it destroyed political power, destroyed familial bonds. Clifford Sifton, is also, as Minister of the Interior, now that he's cleared the prairies, now he's in charge of settling the prairies. Enter the Ukrainians. It is Clifford Sifton who embarks on a program of immigration, sending Canadian agents to Eastern Europe, bringing tens of thousands, in the end, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians to come settle the prairies, to take occupation of the lands that were just deoccupied by indigenous people. And so Sifted is, he's complicated, right? Because he's like, on the one hand, he's everything we want Canadians to be. Open, welcome. He protects Ukrainians when they come. He celebrates their culture in the way that we still do now, today. But Clifford Sifton is also in charge of clearing the prairies repressing indigenous culture, making, you know, he's the one who's bringing in early residential schools. So Clifford Sifton is a 19th century feeling character. He's like both good and evil. But think about our current immigration policy. We still have special programs for Ukrainians, or we do now, because there's a war, and right, we should. But there's wars in Sudan, and Eritrea, and Ethiopia, and somehow, we Clifford Sift in it. We were like, just that's okay and normal, but it's not. That trope of immigration then is one that we've carried. It's a narrative that we've carried with us about our nation. And it's one that we need to look into more closely. One of the great characters in the book is um, a, a gentleman named Nelson. Uh, Nelson's, uh, he's a school teacher, he teaches in town, um, and he retires, and kind of on a lark, um, decides to take a job teaching uh, continuing ed um, on the reserve. So now his students are grandmothers, their parents, their kids as well. 
And this is, Nelson is the kind of guy who spent 70 years going for lunch at the hotel bar, swapping racist Indian jokes with his buddies. He freely admits it. If we ask him, he said in a moment of just incredible self-reflection, he said, I used to be a racist. And then he added, and I think I still am which is an amazing bit of self-awareness, one that we could all learn from. So Nelson takes his teaching job, and he settles in, and slowly over time, he starts to learn. First of all, he's appalled. When you go from a school that's getting $10,000 per student to a school that's getting $6,000 per student, it's apparent immediately there are no textbooks, there is no technology. All of the teachers are terrible. So Nelson sees that there's a difference. But he also starts to learn through assignments about the hardships that people are going through, about the difficult family lives they have. And what strikes him as remarkable is that they keep coming to school because they want to learn. They come through the snow and the rain. They come despite there's no textbooks. They come despite there's 35 kids in his class. They still come because they want to learn. And Nelson changes. He comes to see his indigenous neighbors in a brand new light. And they learn to see him in a new light. Nelson had polio as a child. So he's stiff in his feet. But when he goes to a hockey game on the reserve, people pull up chairs for him because they've learned. And he's learned. Andrew spoke for a little bit earlier about uh, Maureen, who's sort of the hero of the story. Her story opens the book, it closes the book. Uh, we follow her um, from her first arrival on the reserve. She's pulled out of a school in the city uh, to go to school in Weiwei and in Rossburn. Uh, she's one of the lucky ones. She actually manages to graduate. Um, and uh, then goes to university, gets a master's degree. Uh, spoiler alert, she comes back to the community eventually and begins serving as uh, the indigenous initiatives officer in, in a combined school district. But Maureen is like Nelson too, and this is important. The learning and the changing isn't just one way. It's not like all the settler white people change miraculously and the Indians all remain the same. That's not really a story. It's not a true story. In truth, Maureen, you know, she got the education we all got. So she doesn't understand anything about the history of the prairies when she's in elementary and high school. One day while she's in class, they're talking about the history of, um, uh, Man or of Manitoba. And one of the Ukrainian kids in the back of the class jumps up and yells, it's ours, we were here first which is a sentiment among Ukrainian kids, because that's the narrative, right? That's the story they were told. We were here first. We broke the land. We populated. We overcame. The Indian side of the story is just sort of left out. So Maureen, like, literally has no ammunition. She has no knowledge of history. She has no other narrative. So she just sucks it up and cries in the back of the class. By university, she starts learning about her neighbors. Maureen didn't know anything about that story of Ukrainian immigration I just told you. She didn't know that in the First World War, Ukraine was allied with the Kaiser. So what did we do? We rounded up all the Ukrainian men and we interned them. So we have one community under the past system, everyone locked down on the reserve, right across the river on the other side, Ukrainians interned. They know nothing about one another. But Maureen learns about those stories, and she learns about the hardship that Ukrainians actually went through, struggling to arrive, to break the land, to learn the language. She admires them. People learn and change. And it's the idea that people can change that really drives 
Stobo and I. It's what makes us want to come out here and talk to people. It's why we wrote the book. And the change that we're talking about towards the end of the book is significant change. What happens in Rossburn and Weiwei about 12 or 15 years ago is that the federal government agrees to fund the Weiwei school to the same level as the Rossburn schools, so federal funding will equal provincial funding, provided that the schools join forces in the region. They form a single school board. They share resources. The reserve school pays into a centralized fund to share speech pathologists and the like. And what happens? Wow, well, I mean, it's still early data collection wise, but the kids are reading at grade level now, mostly. They're advancing through the grades. They're coming to school. They're bringing their textbooks back. You know, everything's getting better in that school. And so we got to that point in the writing and we could have just put our hands up and gone, and so there we go, the answer is more funding. And I guess there's a world in which that's part of the answer and I will always be part of the answer. But you know, still and I both worked in politics and you know, there's one thing uh, about that decision that a government makes to provide equal funding, just as this current government has, another government can change its mind. We're 5% of the population. We make almost no electoral difference. There's no cost to cutting education funding for indigenous kids, because like Stobo said earlier, when it happens in the province, 90% of families feel it and they rise up. When it happens on an Indian reserve, nobody even notices. So the answer can't just be, oh, some more money for a while until there's not more money. We think that the way that you solve this problem of indigenous kids getting ripped off is to put their parents in charge of the funding to put the community in charge of that education program. Not just the administering it, that's important obviously, but paying for it too. So what we talk about towards the end of Valley is ways of thinking about our country, the way it's structured, the way it's put together, economic ties, and how we could bring indigenous people into that system of economic confederation. So what we imagined is in some places in Canada, indigenous people are by far, far the vast majority and always have been. It makes almost no sense at all for decisions about what's happening in those areas to be made in the South where it doesn't affect anybody. Think about what it would take to put indigenous people in charge of some of those territories so that they might operate the way governments do. And the way a government works is a government taxes people and things. And then they spend that money on libraries and potholes and hospitals. And that's the way every government works except an Indian government through the Indian Act. Bans Indian governments are almost statutorily prohibited from raising any money. They have almost no powers of taxation. And that means all the money that flows, flows from a different order of government. The federal government just sending money. That's not a government. Governments make choices about resource extraction. They're the ones who choose what gets taken out. And so we imagine that in some areas of the country it makes sense to turn control of the land and the resource decisions over to collections of indigenous nations. I mean, not communities of one in 2,000 people, they're too tiny. They'd have to be a bigger collection. They'd, indigenous groups would have to come together to decide to govern a territory. 
And doing that, we realize, is going to impose a cost on provinces who are no longer going to be the recipients of all of that resource wealth. Just to give you just an idea of like what that actually means, in Ontario, every year, about a billion dollars in stumpage fees is collected by the province of Ontario. That's, so that's not the value of the timber. That's just what companies pay to cut the timber. So we're talking about a lot of money. And what we imagine then is that indigenous nations, who are going to be very well off under the scenario, will contribute to something like an equalization program that will flow money back to the provinces. And why is that important? It's important because these situations, these issues, are political. They're not legal problems. And that means all of you, all of your families, you're all going to have to decide that this is the kind of thing that you want. It's the kind of thing that you're going to press your politicians for. Because indigenous people on our own, 5% of the population, we're never, ever going to do it. And so what that means for me, as an academic, is i got to think about you. And I think for so long, indigenous people have made our claims to right without realizing that although we're right, although we're just, although our claims are moral, we are asking to impose a cost on everyone else. And I want you to know that I'm aware of that. And I want to think through ways to make that palatable. Because that sort of political support is the only way that we're going to be able to move forward. It'll have to be together. And the way that change happens is people start asking questions of their politicians. What's the plan? No, 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 not another program, not increased funding. What's the plan? And when people start asking those questions, politicians will start asking those questions. And then civil servants will start figuring out how we're going to do this. The ideas that we propose in Valley are straightforward. They're things we already do in our system of federalism. We're just imagining, basically, a comprehensive treaty regime, like in British Columbia, like in Yukon, like in northern, Man or northern uh, Quebec, but just expanded to more parts of the country where indigenous people are in control of territories, they're not receiving funds from the federal government anymore, they're financing their own children's education, they're paying for their own potable water, they're making decisions, good decisions about how to live as a community. And that's, I think, a Canada that we both want to see. It's a co-authored version of Canada, and I think it's one that is actually achievable, maybe not in our lifetime, and that's another thing I want to say. And this is very, very important. People want stuff now. They want to see change happen right away. And that's just not how it works. This is a long struggle. We are in this for a while. It took us 150 years to get here. It's going to take us a while to get out. So I don't want you to be discouraged if things don't change right away. What I'm most encouraged by is actually the land acknowledgement, which I, people, isn't it tokenistic? Well, yeah, it is. But, Remember the background narrative, right? All of our kids are growing up in a world where every morning they get up and they realize they're living on Indian land. When they're adults, think about what that would mean. Like, we can't even imagine turning land over to Indians because we didn't grow up knowing that it was already their land. But this generation coming, tremendous change is possible if we can position ourselves to take advantage of it, that generation will do incredible work for us. So it's time to dig in, it's time to bear down, but don't expect a lot of change soon. These things take time and we have to commit to the long term. And I think that, I'm gonna wrap up that up now. Um, we're gonna have another session in another ballroom or another room. I think we're all gonna leave here um, and uh, Stobin, and I would be happy to spend an hour with you uh, doing questions and answers. Any comments you have about the book, we'd be happy to hear. So thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I hope lunch was awesome. Thank you.